Right, so let me just first quickly recap what we saw yesterday. So we saw that, you know, the definition of a regularity structure, which is basically just a graded vector space, and you should think of this as being some generalization of space of abstract polynomials, um, <clears throat> together with a group that acts on it in such a way that, you know, it has this property, um, and said if it acts on a homogeneous element of some degree, then it's the identity plus terms of lower order of lower degree. Um, and you should think of this as being some kind of generalization of the operation of re-expanding, right? So looking at the coefficients of a polynomial that's sort of based at a point x0 and then re-expanding it around a different point x1. That would be the typical example in that case, that group would just be uh, a copy of Rn, where n is the number of indeterminates uh, for your space of polynomials, right? So that would be the simplest example. Um, but in, uh, and in that case, that group is abelian, right? Um, but in general, we'll see in a second that you have to enlarge that group. So it will not just be Rd with addition. Uh, and in particular, it actually becomes non-abelian also. Um, <clears throat> And then given such a, so you should think of a regularity structure as some sort of algebraic skeleton. Um, and then in order to be useful to do analysis uh, and probability, you want to, in some sense, look at some kind of representation of that uh, algebraic structure. Um, and that's what we call a model, right? And so a model it's essentially a collection of linear maps. So every element of T gets turned into a distribution, but this collection depends on the choice of base point, right? And so you should think of, for example, in the case of polynomials, you should think of T as being polynomials in some abstract indeterminate, and then the pi X, <clears throat> the operation of turning that abstract indeterminate into dot minus X, for example, right? And view this as an actual function. Um, and of course, the function is sort of identified with a distribution in the natural way. Um, and then you want a collection of these gamma xy's that are elements of G, um, and they should have the property, this coherence property. And remember, this coherence property was that uh, pi x composed with gamma xy is equal to pi y. Right, so this makes sense because pi is a linear map from t to distributions. Gamma xy is an element of G, but we interpret these with linear maps. We identify elements of G with linear maps from t to t. Right, so here you go from t to t and then from t to distribution. That's the same as just going from t to a distribution. And so you should think of gamma xy as taking an expansion, taking the coefficients of something like a Taylor expansion around the point Y and turning them into coefficients for a Taylor expansion around X without actually changing the Taylor expansion, right? So it's just about changing how you represent it, but not actually changing if you want the, uh, the actual function that it represents. Um, and then you, you want some natural sort of analytic bounds, right? So that one, they essentially say that the notion of degree here, at this point, the notion of degree is completely artificial. It's a totally algebraic thing. Um, and actually in this definition, if I change the degrees, as long as I keep them in the same order, it doesn't make any difference, right? Uh, so as far as this property is concerned, it only makes a difference if somehow the order of the degrees changes, but as long as they stay in the same order, it doesn't make any difference. But here it does. So you want the degree to really have an interpretation as uh, you know, something like the order at which things vanish around the point. Um, and that's encoded in this upper bound here. Um, and then there's a similar bound for the gammas that one wants to impose. This one in some sense is less important because in all the, all the examples that we construct uh, for stochastic PDEs, this bound actually ends up following from that one. So in the sense that the gammas are pretty much determined by the pi x's, right? Because they are somehow 
there's typically not much choice for the gammas if you want this to hold. Um, and in the way that the constructions go, uh, the way you prove this bound for the pi x is immediately automatically sort of gives you that bound for the gammas. Okay. Um, and then once you have such a regularity structure together with a model, you can build sort of holder type spaces. And as I mentioned at the end of uh, last lecture, you can not only build Hilda type spaces, you can build analogs of pretty much every classical function space. Okay, so there are Sobolev spaces and Bezos spaces and inhomogeneous Bezos spaces and, you know, LPQ type spaces and so on. Right? So you can kind of make all your favorites somehow, you know, exotic function space that sort of behaves maybe in different ways in different directions even and so on. Uh, in pretty much all the examples that I've seen, there's a natural analog um, in this context. Um, and typically the various, you know, embedding and product theorems and so on, um, they still hold provided that you interpret the exponents correctly. So there's sometimes a little bit of subtlety. Um, and we're going to see that already in the, the rules for multiplying elements of this D gamma. And so now what you want is you want to, right, so this is super abstract. And so we've seen there's that reconstruction theorem that tells you that if you have a model and you have an element of this D gamma space, then it does really represent a unique distribution. So it's sort of a concrete thing. Um, but now we want to apply this to the study of sort of single SPDs. And so you want to actually have a calculus that's rich enough in order to rewrite you know, your SPD as a fixed point problem in one of these spaces. And so for this, what sort of operation do you want? Right? So if you take these simple examples, so for example, KPZ, or there's this 5-4 equation. Um, so they're always of the form, so we're always going to look at parabolic equations here. Um, some of what I'm saying can be possibly generalized to non-parabolic equations. Um, but that's trickier. Um, so of parabolic in a general sense, right? The fact that this is a Laplacian is not so important. It could be a Laplacian square, for example. Um, and then a nonlinearity where what's somewhat important is that the nonlinearities we look at are local. So in the sense that um, they depend, so the nonlinearity at a point X depends on the solution at X and maybe derivatives of the solution at X, but you don't have like convolution operators or stuff. Actually, you could deal with convolution operators, but what would be harder to deal with is, you know, things like if the derivative of u at x depends on u at x plus one or something like that, right? So this would be harder to encode. Um, okay, so you have a local nonlinearity, which is what appears naturally in physics. Um, and so you want to rewrite these as an integral equation. So take the second example, for example. Um, I write it like this. So I write P for the heat kernel. And then <clears throat> the star here is a space time convolution. Yeah. Um, and well, this is really just variation of constants formula, right? So the variation of constants formula, the fact that the integral in the variation of constants formula starts from zero, right? So it's an integral from zero to T da da da, and not from minus infinity to T that's encoded by the fact that here I put an indicator function uh, of positive for positive times, right? So this here is really just a variation of constants formula. So I rewrite this in mild form if you want. Um, and well, that's the term that shows up from the initial condition, right? So that's just solution to the heat equation with initial condition U zero. Okay, so I rewrite this equation in this integral form and well, same thing for KPZ and so now you want to be able to rewrite this as a fixed point problem in one of these D gamma spaces. And so basically we need to be able to interpret every symbol and operation that appears in this expression, right? So what do we need? So, well, we need to somehow interpret the noise. So the noise is a random distribution that certainly in a classical sense, it's not going to belong to a holder space of, of positive exponent, right? Certainly not, it may be belong, it, belongs to hold the space of negative exponent, but not positive exponent. So we want to somehow encode this still by an element in one of these D gamma spaces with positive gamma, right? 
right? So here, the important thing is we want gamma to be positive, even though the noise itself is, of course, has very negative regularity. Okay, so that's the important part here. Um, and then we want to be able to take products, right? Because we want to be able to interpret u cube, for example. Uh, and we want to be able to take derivatives because we want to interpret dxh, right? So if we have a candidate h, which would be an element in d gamma, we want to know what we mean by dxh. Um, and then, of course, we need the operation of convolution with the heat curve, right? And we want the operation of multiplication by this indicator function, right? So while this one is sort of clear, because at the end of the day, our d gamma elements are still just, you know, functions uh, from r times rn into some vector space t. And so multiplying by a scalar valued function is actually uh, clear what it means. And so the meaning of this will be the meaning that you think simply pointwise multiplication by that indicator function. Okay, but the, the other operations are not so clear, right? So it's not clear how to multiply elements in d gamma. I haven't given you a product. Yes. Um, it's not so clear how to you know, interpret the noise. It's not clear how to interpret that convolution operator. So, so how do we construct? So, that, so here, this is the starting point. Well, so that basically goes with how to reinterpret the noise. Okay. So, so what you do is you want to make some some kind of a minimal construction to be able to, you know, formulate that stochastic P. And so, what you start with, you say, well, okay. So, I certainly need to be able to formulate to describe smooth functions. So I want to have the Taylor polynomial. So I start with the regularity structure that just corresponds to Taylor polynomials, right? So that's the example we saw yesterday where your space T is simply the space of polynomials in you know, how many, however many variables as you have space dimensions or space time dimensions actually, right? So that's your starting point. And then what you do is, for example, you can just add a basis vector to that space. Right, so I, I add a new basis vector. So if you want now at this point, my T, say T, T tilde is the uh, polynomials or, or let me write it like that. So say T at this stage is the polynomials, which we had a sort of, you know, we wrote it as R of uh, purple X. And then we add just one basis vector, right? So we add the span we want of just that one basis vector, right? So now at this stage here, our regularity structure is this, and we postulate that the degree of this basis vector is actually negative. Uh, and we take it something which is below minus d plus two over two. And the reason why we take the reason for this exponent, where does this minus d plus two over two come from, is that white noise, right? If psi is space-time white noise, then psi belongs to C alpha almost surely, if and only if alpha is less than minus d plus two over two. Okay, so that's where this d plus two over two comes from. Uh, and why d plus two and not d plus one? The two comes from the time, and it's because we count things in this parabolic scaling. Okay, that's why time counts as two and not as one. Um, okay, so that's where this exponent comes from. So we just add this basis vector to the regularity structure. Uh, we don't change the group. So the group is still uh, RD with addition and it just acts on X in the same way as before and it acts trivially on Xi. So it just doesn't change the Xi, right? So it just acts as the identity on Xi. And now we extend our model so that on the purple X, on the powers of purple X, it does the same as before. But on the purple Xi, well, the model applied to Xi just gives you the distribution Xi, which you should think of as your space-time white noise. Okay. Um, and then the idea is, well, we start from this and then we look at the operations that we want. And then whenever we want to define an operation, but we sort of feel constrained by our regularity structure being too small, uh, we just sort of add new basis vectors um, in order to, to be able to define that operation. Okay, so that's somehow the, uh, the general philosophy. So for example, 
um, you know, now we have Taylor polynomials that allow us to describe smooth functions. And we have that purple psi that allows us to describe the noise. Now we may want to be able to describe things like smooth function times noise, right? And so that means that we would want to have basis, we want to have a product uh, between the Taylor polynomials and that purple psi. And so here in, you know, as long as our regularity structure is just that, well, there's no natural way of multiplying an element here with an element here. Right, because there just isn't anything in this space that would correspond to this product. Um, and so if we want to include that product, well, we just include it. Right? So I can just add a bunch of symbols. So in some sense, it's like a kind of a free, the free regularity structure uh, you know, containing a certain number of operations, except that these operations will often be sort of partially defined and not fully defined. So it's not like you turn it into an algebra. Right? So for example, here I add new symbol, so the xi xk, which I interpret as the product between xi and x to the k. And so now I have a product which is defined, but it's only partially defined in the sense that I can multiply a power of x with another power of x, which is the natural product of xk with xl is xk plus l. I can multiply a power of x with the purple xi, but I cannot multiply the purple xi with itself. Right, so, so I have a product, but it's not, it doesn't actually turn my space into an algebra. Okay, and, and I don't want to do that because I don't want to ever be forced to consider sort of xi square because xi square, if xi is a space-time white noise is not something that I have any way of naturally defining, right? So it's a feature, the fact that the thing is not actually an algebra, it's not a bug. Um, Okay, and so, so you add these new symbols, um, you postulate that they have the natural degree that you would think in the sense that, you know, the degree of a product should be the sum of the degrees. Um, and then there's a natural way of extending the model, right? Because poly, this guy represents a monomial, this guy represents the noise. I can multiply any distribution with a polynomial, right? This multiplying distributions with a smooth function is not a problem. Um, and so there's a natural way here of extending my model uh, to these symbols. And then, for example, remember we had that theorem uh, which says that if you have a function of certain regularity and a distribution of some other negative regularity and you multiply them, the product is well defined if and only if the sum of the regularities is positive. Okay. So this theorem now becomes a trivial consequence of that reconstruction theorem we had before. Because now what you do is you say, if I take a function in C, so that theorem now in this language, it says, well, if I have a function in C gamma, the usual Helder space C gamma, and I have a distribution psi in C alpha, where alpha is negative, then I can multiply F with psi if and only if alpha plus gamma is positive. Right, so that's what the usual theorem says. Um, and so here that at least the if direction becomes trivial, right? Because if I have a guy in C gamma, then first elements of C gamma, I can interpret them as elements of D gamma by just looking at the Taylor, the usual Taylor expansion at every point. And then I can just do a pointwise product of this F, right? So the capital F is built from little f as before, right? So capital F of X is little f of X times the purple one uh, plus F prime of X times the purple X, etc. cetera, uh, up to order gamma. Um, and then I can multiply this pointwise by Xi, right? So if I multiply this pointwise by Xi, well, that just means that I, I turn this one here into a psi, uh, and I turn this x into a psi times x, and so on, right? And that's new symbols that I've added to my regularity structure, so that has a meaning here. Um, and then you see that as far as the algebraic structure is concerned, multiplying by psi in some sense does nothing, because what, what my structure really is, is just two copies of the space of polynomials, right? It's just one copy, which is the powers of x, and one copy, which I just called psi times power of x. It's basically just the second copy of the space of polynomials. 
The only difference is that the degrees are different, right? So the second copy has all the degrees shifted by alpha. And we had to shift the degrees by alpha because otherwise this guy here would not satisfy the analytic bounds that I imposed on the previous slide, right? So if I didn't shift the degrees, then this guy would not satisfy the analytic bounds. That I have. So I was forced to do that. Um, and then if you do look at the definition of these D gamma spaces, you immediately realize that if you just shift all the degrees by alpha, that's the same as that just moves you from D gamma into D gamma plus alpha. Okay, so now that this guy is in D gamma plus alpha. And then as soon as gamma plus alpha is positive, remember that was precisely the condition that we had uh, so that the reconstruction theorem can be applied. And so that guarantees that this guy does represent some actual distribution. And then this distribution is what I would like to interpret, uh, sort of identify with the product F times Xi. And one can actually check that if the Xi happens to be a smooth function, then it's easy to check that this uh, guy is really just the pointwise product of F with Xi. And then by continuity, we're done. So, so in this way, so here I have a very easy sort of one line proof uh, of that theorem, which was not a hard theorem, but it's sort of a non-trivial theorem of harmonic analysis. Uh, but that really means that it was actually encoded in that reconstruction theorem. Uh, so all the harmonic analysis has to go somewhere, right? And it goes into the proof of that reconstruction theorem. Okay. So, right, so now let me uh, discuss a little bit these various, how do we implement these various operations? So for the product, we've already sort of seen this, right? So that's in the examples that, that I just gave. Um, but then still the, you know, the question one has to ask is, what are the properties of the product that I want so that it sort of behaves naturally, right? Uh, so we've already seen that uh, one property you probably want is that it plays nicely with the notion of degree, right? So like the degree of a product of two homogeneous elements should be a homogeneous element of the sum of the two degrees. Uh, so we want to impose that. Uh, so that's what I mean by compatible with the grading. Um, and then you would want, in general, you want that sort of G invariance and what this G invariance means, right? So compatible with grading is what I just mentioned. It's the product degree of the product is the sum of the degrees. Uh, G invariant means that if you take an element of your group G and you apply it to a product, then that's the same as applying the element to both of the factors separately and then multiplying. Now, this is not, so why is this natural? It's natural because you should think of these elements of G as an operation of re-expanding around a different point without actually changing the function that you're representing, right? And so then if you take two functions and you multiply them and then you re-expand around a different point, but it doesn't actually change the function, it just changed the way you pre represent it, then that should be the same as first re-expanding it around the other point and then multiplying them, right? So it's the same like for, Taylor polynomials, if I have a polynomial in X minus X zero and I rewrite it as a polynomial in X minus X one, uh, then mul multiplying two such polynomials and then rewriting them as polynomials in X minus X one is of course the same as first rewriting them as polynomials in X minus X one and then multiplying them, right? So it's sort of a trivial property uh, of polynomials and you want to impose it. But if you want that property, you have to actually impose this identity, okay? This identity encodes that trivial property. Um, okay, and then the other important thing is I do not impose anything, right? So I do not in particular impose things like pi x of tau one times tau two, equal to pi x tau one times pi x tau two, right? So this, I do not impose something like that. Uh, and why not? Well, I can't, right? Because I just don't know how to define this a priori, right? So what would this mean? 
So here, it's not clear what this product would mean because these guys, they are distribution of some regularity. Um, this could be of sort of very negative degree. So these could be distributions of quite negative regularity and I just don't know how to multiply them in general, right? So I cannot impose something like this. Morally, I still think of it as being something like this, but where I read the definition the other way around, right? So I don't know how to define this. And so I just view this guy as a definition of this product. Right? But I don't impose a priori what the product should be. Yeah. Now, it turns out um, that if, so here, if the degree, if the degree of tau one plus the degree of tau two is positive, uh, then it turns out that pi x of tau one times tau two is actually uniquely defined. It's uniquely defined. And then in some sense, in cases where things are smooth, well, then it has to be equal to that. But what I mean by uniquely defined is that actually, you know, these analytic bounds that we impose on the model, um, which are back here, right? So these analytic bounds, they are sufficiently strong uh, so that there's just no ambiguity. There's only one possible way of defining that guy once you have defined these two guys and you know what the gammas do, right? Uh, so that's the case if the sum of the degrees is positive. And this again, you can be viewed as some kind of generalization of the statement that products are well-defined if sums of the regularities are positive. Okay. Um, except that again, so even if the degree of tau is positive, that does not force pi x tau to be an actual function. Right, because the, the bound that we have on pi x tau, it sort of looks like an alpha holder bound, but it, you only test pi x tau against the test function, which is itself centered around x. Okay. Uh, and so it means that around x, it sort of vanishes a positive order that does not actually imply that it's an actual function. Um, and so then when, if you have such a product, one can actually, it's you know, pretty easy to check that you have some kind of a product multiplication rule for elements in D gamma, uh, which works as follows. So if you take a guy in D gamma one and another guy in D gamma two, um, and you call alpha one and alpha two, the, sort of lowest degree that appears in the description of, you know, F1 and F2, right? So in the sense that, okay, so of course you could always take as alpha simply the lowest degree that appears in your regularity structures, that's fine. Um, but, you know, in general, your Fs may uh, take values in a subspace of your regularity structure and that subspace may be a subspace that only contains homogeneous elements of some higher degree than the minimal degree, right? And then it's advantages to actually define the alphas, uh, say alpha one to be, you know, the lowest such degree. So the lowest degree, which appears in the subspace of the regularity structure that your F1 takes values in, okay? uh, And same for alpha two. Uh, and so then the, it's, so the proof of this is, easy, right? So it's somehow you write F, uh, F1 times F2. It's, it's sort of the same proof as the one that, you know, if you want to prove that the, um, you, know, you, you write down the sort of, when you want to derive Leibniz rule or something like this, right? So I mean, so you just write F1 times F2 minus gamma XY. Uh, so F1 times F2 of X minus gamma XY, F1 times F2 of Y. And then you add and subtract, you know, intermediate terms and you sort of break it up and you use the definitions uh, and you find pretty quickly that you actually have this rule here. So what it tells you is that the product, the regularity of the product of two such elements is this. So it's not 
So in the usual Holder spaces, right? So if you take a Holder function and you multiply with another Holder function, the regularity of the product is the minimum of the two regularities. Right? So here you still have that's the same minimum here, but it's not quite the minimum of the two regularities. It could, it's actually lower in general. Uh, so it's the minimum of what you obtain by taking the regularity of one guy. So that's the gamma one is the regularity of F1. And you add to it the degree of, you know, the, deg the elements of lowest degree that appear in the description of the other guy, right? So if F2 involves elements of degree minus a half, uh, then here you would have gamma one minus a half, right? Or, well, as long as it doesn't involve anything of degree even lower than that. Right? And same thing here, right? So the expression is of course symmetric under exchanging one and two. Um, so this on the one hand, right? So you see it's sort of a combination of, so you get back the usual rule, right? And so in the case of the regular holder spaces, the alphas would be zero, right? Because for the regular holder the spaces, you take values in the space of polynomials. Uh, and of course, in the space of polynomials, the lowest degree that appears is degree zero. And your function will always have something in elements of degree zero, right? Because if it doesn't, then, well, it would be a function that has value zero. Okay? Now, of course, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and then this would be positive. And then that rule still holds because if you multiply a function, any function by zero, then of course it has infinite regularity immediately, right? So you can increase the regularity by just multiplying by zero. Okay? Uh, but otherwise you can't. And so if the functions are non-zero, then these alphas are zero. And then you're just back with the usual rule, which is the, that the regularity of the product is just the minimum of the two regularities. Okay? But here in general, these alphas may be negative, right? especially in the case of these singular SPDs, because you want to describe things like the right-hand side, which might be distributional. And typically if you element in D gamma describes a distribution, uh, that means it has to actually involve elements of negative degree in its description. Okay, and in that case, when you multiply here, you actually lose a bit of regularity. Um, okay, so that's about multiplication. Then differentiation is somehow somewhat easy to define. I mean, in some sense, you can just pointwise Right, so differentiation is a pointwise operation also. And so it has the property, at least for the usual Taylor expansions, it has the property that the derivative, the Taylor expansion of the derivative of a function is just the derivative of the Taylor expansion, right? Um, so you basically want to do the same here. And so if you want to do the same here, that means that you need to actually provide yourself with a differentiation operator on your space T, right? So remember your space T is just some finite dimensional space, which, you know, maybe or could be counted, could be sort of infinite dimensional, but if you add sort of higher order degrees, it's sort of basically projective limit of finite dimensional spaces. Um, and so on that space, you want some kind of operation of differentiation, but at the completely algebraic level, right? So in the space of polynomials, you have one already, right? The derivative of x to the k, well, there's a natural definition, which is that's k times x to the k minus one. Uh, but now if I add extra symbols like this psi, well, okay, so then maybe I don't have a derivative uh, on psi. Um, so then you have to define yourself a derivative and in general, maybe you don't want to define it on the whole space, but just on some subspace again but the subspace should be large enough to be able to allow you to describe those elements that you actually want to take a derivative of. Um, and so then again, on this space, you just assume that you have the differentiation maps. And so a differentiation map would just be something that again, respects degrees in the sense that the derivative of some homogeneous element should be another homogeneous element of degree lowered by one. Um, it should commute with this group G. That in some sense reflects the fact that it's a local operation. So remember, like the product essentially commute, we impose that it commutes with G and that was because the product is also a local operation. Uh, 
Um, and then as far as derivatives are concerned, you can take the derivative of any distribution, right? So it's not like the product where you couldn't. So in the case of the product, I couldn't really impose anything on the models uh, as far as the product is concerned. For derivatives, I can, and so I do. Okay, so I say that if you want the models that I'm going to consider will always have the property that, so if I'm, if I'm given an operator that I call a differentiation operator on the space T, uh, then implicit in this name is the fact that the models that we're considering will always be such that uh, when you apply your model to the derivative of some element, then it is really the derivative of the model applied to that element. Right, so derivative in the sense of weak derivative in the space of distributions. And this again, it's actually always possible to just, you know, you can always make your regularity structure larger by just adding new basis elements if you don't have a natural candidate already to represent if you want the derivative of some element. Um, and here it's uniquely determined. I mean, like the model the action of the model on the new basis elements that you add, well, it's basically uniquely determined by enforcing this, right? Um, and then one can prove that it does what it's supposed to do on uh, these D gamma spaces, right? So it maps D gamma into D gamma minus one. And if you apply the reconstruction to the derivative, that's just taking the derivative. Okay, so then there's no surprise here. Um, So then the last operation that we want, right, in order to be able to formulate our fixed point uh, problem, the last operation we need is convolution with the heat kernel, right? Um, and so this is, again, the philosophy is somewhat similar to before in the sense that, well, you have an operation, so you want to ask yourself what is a natural corresponding operation at the level of your regularity structure? What properties should it have? Um, so here the natural thing to impose is that you have some, um, again, some linear map from T to T or from, from some subspace of T uh, to T, which this time if we think of it as being convolution with the heat kernel, it should increase the degree, right? Because it should somehow reflect the fact that when we convolve any distribution with the heat kernel, the degree, the regularity of that distribution gets increased by two. Remember, so that's the Schauder estimate we saw at the beginning of last lecture. Um, and so a reflection of this is the fact that we impose that the degree of I tau for any homogeneous element tau is the degree of tau plus beta and beta in the case of the heat kernel would just be two, right? So you should really think of beta as being two, okay? Because so here we look at space time kernels that behave like X to the beta minus D minus two and the heat kernel behaves like X to the minus D. So beta is equal to two which X to the minus D with the parabolic scaling is the T to the minus D over two. So that's the decay of the heat kernel on the diagonal. Um, and then again, we want to, we would want to somehow have this operation kind of reflected in our choice of models, right? So now the natural thing, you know, naively you would think, well, okay, so we should impose that again, the model applied to I tau is just a convolution with say heat kernel of the heat kernel say with pi of tau. And then maybe we should also impose that this commutation um, between the group G and uh, this operation. Now, if you define, if you impose this, you realize pretty quickly that this becomes inconsistent. Okay, so you can kind of impose this if you want, uh, but then what you find is, is that this guy will simply not even if this guy satisfies the analytic bounds that you impose in your definition of a model, this guy is not going to satisfy these bounds, right? Because for example, suppose that tau is of degree minus one. So then this is a distribution. Uh, so then I tau is supposed to be of degree plus one, right? So minus one plus two. And degree plus one, pi x of 
this guy being of degree plus one, it means that this should be a function now that vanishes at the point X at order one. But you know, if I take here a basically an arbitrary distribution and I convolve it with the heat kernel, well, you know, I get some function. Um, if this was a distribution of regularity minus one, I get a function of regularity plus one. There's no reason for that function to vanish at d point x, right? Even if that distribution in some sense behaved nicely at x or something, there's just no reason for that guy to vanish at x, right? And so the analytic bounds that I impose on my models, they're going to be completely, um, yeah, they're just not going to be satisfied by that. And so I have to somehow modify this this definition, which is really what I would like to write down uh, in such a way that this guy does vanish at the point X. And so the only thing I can do here is to subtract basically it's classical Taylor expansion. So this is just the Taylor expansion of that guy at the point X right, up to order the degree of I tau. Right? So now you could say, well, you know, is it clear that this is well defined? Because maybe, you know, maybe this guy is not sufficiently regular and so on. It turns out that this is actually always well defined in an analytical sense, right? There's no, no trickery required. Um, okay, well, there's a little bit of trickery required, but not much. Um, and then, same thing, if you now define this guy in this way, then it turns out that. You know, if you define the gammas like that, then it's just not going to be true that pi x of gamma x y is equal to pi y, right? And so, if you make this modification, you can figure out that you actually have to modify this relation as well. Um, and so here, I'm not going to write down. There's a formula you can write down, but it just looks horrible. Uh, you know, it's sort of essentially a mishmash of two formulas like that, put into rolled into one. Um, the point here is that you, you just get something here which lives in the usual Taylor polynomials, right? Because all you do here, you want to somehow take into account the fact that you've modified this by subtracting its classical Taylor polynomial here uh, at the point X. And then you want to re-expand that guy at the point Y, right? So it's not quite just re-expanding that guy because the coefficients here depend on X as well, right? So it's not just a case of re-expanding the Taylor polynomial bit at y. It's also a case of you know, changing the evaluation of this guy from the point x to the point y. Okay, so that's what you have to do here. Uh, but the point is what you do is just a manipulation of actual Taylor polynomials. Okay, so whatever you put here, it's something which is going to be in the span of the usual sort of Taylor polynomials. But that forces you to actually make the group G larger, right? Because you now, so even if even if before, for example, your G was just translations in R D, which is what it is for the polynomials, uh, then as soon as you add a basis vector like this, you want now your group G to be large enough to contain these operations, and so you have to actually extend the group G. Okay. Um, and the intuition here of why we had to add this bit um, is that contrary to the previous two operations, convolution is not a local operation, right? And therefore, like the Taylor expansion of the convolution of a function with something has nothing to do with the convolution of the Taylor expansion, right? So I cannot compute the Taylor expansion of the heat kernel applied to some function at a point x by simply looking at detail expansion at x and then up convolving that with the heat kernel, right? That, that, that wouldn't make any sense. Uh, so convolution with the heat kernel is not a local operation at all. So it doesn't act sort of pointwise on Taylor expansions. Um, and that's why, you know, we cannot just define this like that. But in some sense, it's almost local in the sense that the kernels that we consider are kernels that have only a singularity at the origin. And so in a way they can be written as something which is singular but supported in a very small neighborhood of the origin plus something smooth, right? So you could always write it as a sum of one bit which just contains the singularity and then a kind of smooth remainder. And it's just that if I excise this, 
very small neighborhood around zero to take the singularity out, then the remainder is going to be very big. Somehow, right? um, and so in that sense, convolution with such kernels is still almost a local operation because if I take convolution with something which is supported in a very small neighborhood around the origin, then that's almost a local operation, right? I mean, convolution with a delta function, which actually sits at the origin, that is a local operation because it's the identity. But for example, convolution with the derivative of a delta function is also a local operation because it is actually just the operation of differentiation. Uh, and so convolution with something which sits in a very small neighborhood of zero is almost a local operation, right? So morally, convolving with something like a heat kernel is something like a local operation modulo something smooth, okay? And that's somehow the intuition behind the fact that we can tweak this naive definition by something that only involves the Taylor polynomials, right? And the Taylor polynomials are what allows us to describe smooth functions. Okay, so that, that's sort of the intuition here. Um, okay, and so now, now in principle, we have all the operations we need. It's not clear, right? So we have some sense, we have a cooking recipe for producing a large enough regularity structure because we basically just say we start from the polynomials, we add one basis vector which represents the noise, and then we just look at, you know, we sort of write down our fixed point problem. So now our fixed point problem, the convolution with the heat kernel becomes something like this pointwise application of I but then plus some stuff which involves the Taylor polynomials and I'm not going to, you know, there is a way of defining this operator, but that definition is somewhat complicated and it wouldn't really help, you know, showing you some very horrible formula. Um, it would, uh, would just uh, take a while. Um, but the important fact is that this convolution with the heat kernel can basically be implemented, right? So you can find an operator say curly P or here I call it curly K, which is an operator from D gamma to D gamma plus beta, which is something like convolution with K. Okay? Uh, and it is of the form, um, so I didn't write that here, right? But so this, this operation curly K is of the form curly K applied to F at a point X, this might be a space time point, is just this local operation, which is I applied to F of X, plus additional stuff, but the additional stuff takes values. Um, so that guy takes values in the span of all the X to the Ks. Right? So in some sense, that's something like a Taylor polynomial at every point. It's not, so it's not that this guy can be split into a smooth function and a D gamma guy, right? So it's only the sum here, which is in D gamma, right? So in some sense, this thing is like a set of Taylor polynomial at every point, but it's not the Taylor expansion of a smooth function, right? So it is just at every point, there's a kind of Taylor polynomial, but then there's this additional guy also, this I F of X and both together give you an element of D gamma plus beta. So you have a, like a Schauder estimate in this sense. So it's... Okay, so now you have this operation. And now we just want to write our fixed point problem like this, and we want to interpret this product as a pointwise product somehow in our regularity structure. And we want to interpret this convolution as you know multiplication or applying this operation I and then plus some stuff, but that stuff just involves the Taylor polynomials and they already belong to our regularity structure, right? And so, and this guy, right, so this here takes values in the regular, in the Taylor polynomials and the noise, well, here, for example, in the example of this phi four equation in dimension three, for example, it would have degree minus D plus two over two, which in dimension three is three plus two over two, which is five over two. Right. So in dimension three, this guy would have degree basically minus five halves. Um, and so now we can just 
you know, add new elements to our regularity structure, you know, as long as we need in order to be able to close this fixed point problem, right? in order to be able to formulate this fixed point problem and to have it, to close it in the sense that, you know, if we can make sure that the right hand side ends up in a D gamma space with positive gamma, then we have an actual interpretation for it, right? Because then we can apply the reconstruction operator to it. Um, and then we need to make sure that the amount of regularity you lose by taking these products is less than what you gain by applying this guy, right? So this guy allows you to gain two degrees of regularity. The product here makes you lose some regularity because you multiply by a distribution and altogether you want to gain something. So as long as you gain something altogether, you can actually solve that fixed point problem locally. And so here's a sort of convenient graphical notation for the elements the new basis elements that you have to add to your regularity structure for this, right? So if I, I graphically sort of represent the noise by just a dot and I graphically represent applying I by drawing a downward facing line. So for example, this guy here is just graphical notation for I of Xi. Right? And that's just a new basis vector that I introduced into my regularity structure and that I interpret as being <clears throat> the operator I applied to the basis element Xi. Right? So in some sense, it's simultaneously also a definition of the linear map I on my regularity structure. Uh, and then multiplying these symbols is just joining them at the root. Right, so for example, this guy here would be I of Xi square. Right, and so and again, all of these guys are just new basis vectors that I add to my regularity structure. But you see that, for example, in order to be able to formulate this equation, I never need to add, say, I of Xi cube, uh, I of Xi four, right? I don't need that guy in my regularity structure, so I don't put it in there. So again, I don't turn this into an algebra somehow, um, because, well, you know, in the description of U, oops, in the description of U, I'm going to have I of Xi appearing. Right? And then in the right hand side, I want to take the cube. I, do, I don't need to be able to take a power four. Right? And then that cube is going to give me terms like, you know, I of Xi square and I of Xi cube in the right hand side. But then as far as U is concerned, that gives me additional terms in U, but they are additional terms that are like I of I of Xi cube. Right. Um, okay, and so, you know, so for example, that's that one, right? So if I go to the next degree of my Pika iteration, if you want, you would end up Right, so at first level, the U is of the form I of Xi plus some stuff taking values in the Taylor polynomial. So here, for example, I don't know yet what function this would be. So I just write the generic function U times the first guy in my Taylor polynomials. And then I put this back into my APK iteration. Right, so I, write, I look at what is U cube. So that was here. What is U cube for this first order guy? That's this. And then I just put this back in here and apply this again. So then I see that U at the next level, I get that guy. And then again, I put this into U cube, so I get additional terms uh, and I can put this back in and so on. But what I realize is that the degrees here increase. So this guy has degree minus five halves. I increases degree by two, right? So here the degree of this guy is basically just minus one half. Here I have like minus three half because when I multiply, the degrees add up. Uh, but then I, again, increases degree by two, so minus three half. If I increase by two, I already end up at plus three half here. Uh, three halves. Right, and then for example, here I have minus one. Here I have plus three half and then minus one, so I have plus one half. Right, and so here I have plus one and so on. Uh, here I have minus a half 
So you see that the degrees of the new terms that I get, they sort of tend to increase. And so if I want to set this up as a fixed point problem in one of these D gamma spaces, I see that I can actually just truncate after some, you know, after some finitely many terms, right? Because in the definition of these D gamma spaces, I only need to look at an expansion up to order gamma. Right? And so that tells me that you see, so it shows me that in order to be able to formulate this equation as a fixed point problem um, in my regularity structure, I just need to extend it by adding a finite number of basis vectors. Right, so I need to add this guy and that guy and that one, that one, that one, that one, and so on, right? But there's only finitely many of them. Um, and at some point I've got enough of them so I can actually formulate this as a fixed point problem in a D gamma space for a gamma which is large enough so that the right hand side here is still in a D gamma space with positive gamma. Okay, right, so because remember here the U U has this alpha, which is minus a half. So it means every time I multiply by U, I lose a half worth of regularity. And so in order for this U cube to be in a D gamma space with positive gamma, I need the U itself to be in D gamma for gamma bigger than one, right? Because then I'm going to lose a half whenever I multiply with U and I multiply twice with U when I take the cube. Right, so, so here I want to, I want to take u in d gamma for some gamma bigger than one. Right, and so here is, you see, the actual regularity of the solution is minus a half, right? The solution is a distribution of regularity minus a half, but we can do as if these things were in something which is like a holder space, for some exponent bigger than plus one. Right? And actually you can make it as big as you want by somehow you know, truncating this further down the line. Um, and so, right, and so then once you've done this, you can really set this up so that the iteration maps, you know, a D1 plus something space. So if you go a bit higher than one into something which has actually better regularity um, and then you play the usual tricks that if you have a gain in regularity, if you restrict yourself to short times, you can turn this into small norms. And so you get a contraction and then you get PK iteration and so on. Right? So you just do the, you know, the completely standard argument for, for PK iterations uh, to get a solution theory. Um, and so, oh, okay. So I think I'm so sort of running out of time. So I think maybe I should say a few words on, um, this randomization bit. So, so, right, so, so, you need, so now we can formulate this just as a regular fixed point problem in one of these spaces. It's a perfectly nice somehow uh, fixed point problem. So where's the difficulty hidden now, right? So it looks like, oh, we just played these algebraic tricks. We can kind of turn this into this problem. Okay, so there's lots of theorems behind which I told you about, about, you know, there is analogs of child estimate and so on. Um, but in some sense, none of these are sort of, none of these have much probabilistic content, right? So this is pure analysis, everything I told you so far. And so where does the probability come in? Uh, the probability comes in when you need to actually define the model for this regularity structure, right? Because it's perfectly fine. Defining the model for this guy is fine. The, this guy is just your space-time white noise. Here you convolve your space-time white noise with the heat kernel, perfectly fine. And now you want to square it, right? And so here, well, it's not clear. So I have a distribution, you can't square it. So you can do it, you can take the Wick square, what I did before, right? That means you sort of change the definition of the square. Here you can take the Wick cube um, and that's actually perfectly fine. Then here again, you convolve these guys with the heat kernel, that's fine. But now here you have a problem. So you have that Wick cube, which you want to multiply with some kind of Wick square and they're still, sufficiently irregular so that that product is not meaningful in general, right? So, so it's not clear how that guy is defined. And if you just define that one as a weak product, that's actually not a good definition because it turns out that it doesn't actually satisfy the analytical bounds that you want these things to satisfy, right? So it's not clear how to define that guy, for example. 
So, so here is where this randomization business comes in, right? So you have to actually understand how you can modify the definitions of a product in a way that gives you enough freedom to sort of subtract partial expectations or sort of counter terms to these guys so that they have limits as epsilon goes to zero, but things don't get messed up. So they, they still play nice with this whole algebraic structure that I've set up uh, in such a way that, you know, the corresponding model still satisfies the right analytic bounds and you have this re-expansion operation and so on, and these should still be, play nice somehow, right? So then here there's really some kind of subtle point uh, that one needs to understand. Um, but, okay, so I think I should probably, okay, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I, I was pretty optimistic uh, about how far I would be able to go there. <laughs> but I think, I, I hope I've given you at least, you know, some sort of idea of how the arguments work there. Uh, and, you know, that there's something you can, <laughs> you can take away from these lectures. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin. That was uh, this is now a, we have now a good starting point to think about re regularity structures. <laughs> oh, there's a question in the chat. Uh, yeah. Is it possible to encode non-local differential operators into the regularity structure? For example, something like a fractional Laplacian. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, so as far as the um, you, so for example, if you. If you want to, uh, right, so, oops, let me go back to the, to the examples at the very beginning, right? So if you want to replace this Laplacian by a fractional Laplacian, um, sort of yes and no. I mean, it, okay, so the problem is if you look at the heat kernel for the fractional Laplacian, then no, wave equation is harder. Uh, so for the fractional Laplacian, the heat kernel actually has a singularity at t equals zero. So the heat kernel for the usual Laplacian is singular at t equals zero, but only actually at t equals zero and x equals zero, right? Because if you think of the function, you know, if you have one over t to the d over two, e to the minus x square over t, um, it looks like there's a singularity at t equals zero, but if x is non-zero, then this guy goes to zero so fast, that it's actually not singular at all at t equals zero, right? It's a perfectly smooth function at t equals zero, except when x is zero as well. Right? Whereas for the fractional Laplacian, that's not the case. Okay, so the, for the fractional Laplacian, uh, there is actually a singularity that remains at t equals zero. It's not a very bad singularity. So it's not like the function blows up or anything, right? So it still goes to zero but it just doesn't go to zero uh, in a sufficiently fast way at t equals zero in order to give you something C infinity somehow. Right? So it gives you something which has a, some held of regularity at time zero away from the origin, uh, but it's not C infinity. That's not, it's not a huge problem, but it just makes things a bit annoying, right? So you have to be a little bit more careful uh, in various places, but yes, you can do that. So replacing sort of the Laplacian by a fractional Laplacian, it's technical. Uh, and you have to redo some work, but you can do it. I don't think I've, anybody actually did it. Uh, there might be some paper where people sort of did it in special examples also. I don't think there's sort of a general theory that tells you because it, it's a little bit subtle in places somehow. Uh, yeah, so for wave equation, of course, there the problem is that you have singularities all over the light cone, right? So, so it's much worse somehow than the fractional Laplacian, you have this t equals zero, but it's not a very bad singularity. The wave equation, well, you know, the propagator is similarly singular everywhere on the light cone. Um, and that's a problem. I mean, you can still do things like that, um, but you don't have such a, there's not such a sort of neat, self-contained, nice, clean theory anymore. It becomes much messier. So when you try to prove this um, convergence uh, theorem, so you, you smooth the equation and then and then try to prove it converges to the to the normalized uh, equation, 
do you do you uh, so what what's the uh, general strategy do you, do you prove this convergence uh, at the level of the regularity structure and then and then use the con uh, reconstruction operation yeah so that's right so that that's the the strategy that i explained at the end of last lecture right mm -hmm. uh, which is that so now we can kind of right so now now i hope that with the explanation of today this picture maybe becomes clearer right so so now what we do is we, so if we have, we build our regularity structure. So right, so now we see how, you know, so you have these new elements. So for example, you have like that guy, for example, right? Um, and things like this. So now if you have a smooth noise, there's a very natural way of lifting it to this regularity structure. Right, so you, there's a natural way of defining the model here for a smooth noise, which is well, you would take you know, uh, you would take your noise, convolve it with the heat kernel, cube it, then convolve whatever you get here with the heat kernel, and then multiply this by noise convolved with the heat kernel squared. All right, so this is in some sense, the expression that this picture encodes, right? So, it's a, so each of these guys is a noise, each of the lines is a heat kernel. So the bit on the top here is this expression here, then that heat kernel is that heat kernel, and then these two guys are these two guys here, right? So that gives us a natural way of, well, so here I'm, I'm slightly cheating because I haven't recentered it. So this is in some sense of pi and not a pi x. But then there's a way of, from this, you can sort of deduce what the pi x epsilon is. So it's more complicated because you have to subtract these Taylor expansion bits. Right? Uh, but there's a formula for doing that, right? So, so now we have, we take our noise, we build our regularity structure that goes with the equation. So I just sort of explained how to do that. Then we have a canonical way of lifting smooth noises to a model for that regularity structure, right? So that's basically the way to do it. Um, and then we write this as a fixed point problem up there in these D gamma spaces. Solve this just by PK iteration, right? So it's a perfectly nice fixed point problem. So these things are actually now continuous functions up there. They are even at, at the limit, they remain, they're actually continuous functions uh, with values in this space T and they just represent distributions, right? But they're actually continuous functions uh, you have a perfectly nice fixed point problem up there, then you solve it and you apply this reconstruction operator and you find that if you take the model here that you obtain by just doing this canonical lift, then what you get at the end is just a solution to your PD. Right? And so now you want to use the fact that up there, everything is continuous, all the operations are continuous. And so whenever you, if you have convergence of the model, you know that you have convergence of the solution. And now the problem is that if you just look at this model here, it doesn't convert because for example, that square just blows up. And so for example, here you want to subtract, you know, a constant here and here you want to turn that into a big, big cube. So you want to also subtract the constant. And then even here, even what you end up with is not enough. So you still have to subtract the term. Um, and so that's what this randomization group then does, right? So you, you have to think about what are the, what are the operations that are allowed, right? So what are the things that I'm allowed to subtract here uh, in such a way that everything becomes consistent so that I don't break, for example, these, are, these analytic bounds that I impose and I don't, right? So I don't break this whole analytical algebraic kind of structure that I've set up. And then you find out that this gives you a lot of rigidity. So there's actually not that much which is allowed. So you find that in this case, well, all you can do is there's, you know, a bunch of constants that you can fix and you can play with these things. Uh, but there's a very limited number of operations that you can do that preserves this whole structure. But then what you find is that this is actually good enough to be able to do these subtractions to make these guys converge, right? And then you, once you know that the model converges, since everything else is continuous, the solutions converge, right? And then you, it's just a question of reinterpreting what you just did, right? You changed the definition of the model and then you have to prove that what the effect that this has, so the effect of changing the definition of your model 
is to actually just change the PDE that you're solving. Right? And so in this particular case, all it does is it somehow turns the U cube right, into the minus U cube into a minus U cube plus some constant times U in the right hand side of your PDE. And this constant is like a linear combination of the various constants that appear there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, both your examples uh, were the stochastic PDEs with add additive noise. If you have non-trivial diffusion coefficients, uh, do you need to change much? Or? No, no, no. Multiplicative noise is fine. Uh, no, but it can so be non-linear. Non uh, it can be non-linear. It's not a problem. Uh, but as long as, so what you want, right? So, so when you have nonlinear, if you have genuinely nonlinear bits, right, in the sense of like a, an arbitrary smooth function of the solution, then that of course only works if the solution itself is function valued, right? So I, I simply cannot. I mean, like, like th there is simply no way of applying an arbitrary function to a distribution. Right? Yeah. So like taking squares or so is just about fine, but arbitrary function is is not. Uh, well, okay, there there are ex there are exceptions where you can play tricks, but you know, so one example, uh, for example, um, okay, so let me just uh, use this as a blank page. Uh, we can do these one plus one dimensional stochastic heat equation with values in a manifold. So then, then the sort of equation that you want to write down is dt u alpha is equal to dx squared u alpha plus, and then you have the Christoffel symbols of your manifold, which are essentially just arbitrary nonlinear functions, and you multiply this uh, by something like this, and here you have a bunch of vector fields, and you have space-time white noises. Right? So you can look at the equation like that. That's if you want the heat equation with values in a manifold, but these guys are the Christoffel symbols for your manifold, and this is like a square root of the metric. And this we can perfect. It's it's not a problem. So it's sort of just works, right? But here you have multiplicative noise with arbitrary nonlinear functions. Uh -huh. uh, but the, so the space dimension here is one dimensional, right? So, so it's all S1, um, but it's still non-trivial because, you know, the solution is a function, but it's not a differentiable function. So this term is still highly problematic. So in principle, this bit, you could interpret it by E2 calculus. I think this you cannot. So maybe one more uh, quick question. So you mentioned that uh, this theory uh, mainly uh, gives existence for the for a local solution. So uh, what's the main difficulty to 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 uh, to obtain a global solution? What what goes wrong with the simple idea that we we first uh, obtain local solutions and and try to expect some uniform estimates to patch the local solutions to a global solution? Something like oh, that. there's nothing wrong with that. You just need to get the uniform estimate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, the problem with getting the uniform estimate is what do you normally want to do, right? Normally, you want to say, well, okay, so you have some kind of energy bound or something, right? Uh, and so, so if your equation is like this, like, right, so your equation is, okay, so DTU, you take that guy, right, so. So you would say, well, you want some sort of energy bound. So if you, if you apply, if you didn't have the noise, right, it's trivial to get global solutions because you look at the L2 norm and that guy makes the L2 norm decrease, that guy makes the L2 norm decrease, and so everything's fine. Problem is that that guy is not in L2. <laughs> Right? So the L2 norm is just identically infinite all the time. And so you can't just test the solution against itself because you just get an infinite term that comes from that noise. Right? Uh, plus the renormalization messes things up, right? So when you do this, now you have a C epsilon U and that guy goes to infinity, right? And that, that guy pushes in the wrong direction. Okay. So, so now in this particular case, you can actually get, uh, get estimates and, and you can get, right, so you can turn the local solution theory into a global solution theory. Um, and it's, you know, there's no problem. 
but it's not, I mean, the argument is specific to this equation or to something a little bit similar, right? But the, somehow to an equation where the, okay, so if you have an equation where the highest degree nonlinearity on the right-hand side is sort of strongly dissipative, then yes, you can basically turn local into global solution theory. And there are papers by uh, mostly by Hendrik Weber with various co-authors that do that, right? Um, now, if you look at something like Navier-Stokes, then the highest degree nonlinearity preserves the L2 norm, right? So the Navier-Stokes nonlinearity, you get energy estimates, the way you get global solutions for Navier-Stokes is well, you use the fact that the energy is preserved. So the Laplacian makes the energy decrease and the nonlinearity preserves it. Uh, but now that one, we don't know how to exploit it at all. Right? So for example, if you take a situation in which the noise is sufficiently singular so that your solution to Navier-Stokes is no longer in L2, then, then you don't know how to exploit that because you, even if you subtract the singular bit and you look at the equation for the remainder, well, then you have that nonlinear term uh, and it just messes things up. We should thank Martin again and uh, we can close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>